that, please let either myself or executive assistant
Can you hear Ryan? Can you just give Ryan this? Sure. Can anybody hear me that's in the audience? Let me chat that. How do I do? Should I try it again? It's just a test to see if anyone okay so we are getting messages that they can hear me um maybe we just switch microphones oh oh okay okay can you all hear me now thumbs up okay um we have jessica ortiz um she's on zoom jessica are you there She's not here. Okay, I'd still like to read what her supervisor, Brenda Siebert, had to say about her. She's been a passport agent for five years. Uh, Jessica's hire was a huge part of our strategic plan to expand passport services, that is adding an additional agent to the Sunday schedule. Jessica gained valuable experience in December of 2017, working on working a Saturday shift prior to adding a Sunday shift in January 2018. Jessica proved to be an asset and a great addition to our staff with her excellent customer service skills and with the speed at which she processed passport applications. Her speed allowed her to accept several walk-in applicants and with the additional 1935 hours that she worked on Sunday, it afforded us the most prosperous passport year ever, $272,963. Sent, I'm sorry, $272,963 in revenue. In 2019, Jessica accepted the position of the lead passport agent for the weekend shifts. She continued to exhibit ex excellent community customer service skills and is admired by all. She increased her knowledge by studying the passport agent reference material newsletters in her free time and assisted other agents with their appointments when they fell behind. She also provided the passport volunteers with additional training and continued to accept walk-in applicants. She and the weekend staff often well exceeded passport numbers and expectations. The district has received numerous positive feedback notifications from patrons expressing their appreciation. Her leadership on the weekend has helped us to exceed 2018 revenue in the amount of $327,935. In 2020, we closed passport services in early March due to COVID. However, we, we reopened in January, 2021. Jessica returned as our sole agent for the Saturday shift on May 15th, 2021. And on July 11th of that year, she added a Sunday shift. She was our sole agent on Saturday and Sunday for one full year through July 17th, 2022. She executed more than 52 passport applications on three occasions. Although passport services reopened with limited hours due to the pandemic, thanks to her contribution, we had collected $148,470 in revenue. Jessica has worked tirelessly upon adding an additional agent to the weekend schedule this past July. We also added an hour and a half to the Saturday schedule. With her speed, she allows us to double book several of her appointments. On several occasions, the weekend staff have executed as many as 96 applications. For Susie, they were shooting for 100. The weekend staff under Jessica's leadership accounts for more than half of the passport revenue for the district. Therefore, the total revenue for 2022 is 240,100, and this with limited hours and no revenue from passport photos. Her addition has helped to make our strategic plan successful. In these four years, our passport revenue has totaled $988,768. If you add in the three months of 2020 prior to closing for COVID, the revenue is over a million dollars. Thanks, Jessica, for the part you played in making this happen. Thank you very much. This working? Good. Well, I've got the pleasure of uh, talking about uh, three of the library staff tonight. The first is Panchapayo Pai, uh, who's a senior accountant in finance uh, working for Will Liu. Uh, she will not be able to attend tonight because she recently gave birth 
uh, to a baby uh, boy. Uh, I guess New Year's Eve. Wow. <laughs> what a way to spend that. Um, but uh, Will wrote about her, I am grateful to have a rock star like you on the team. Stepping into your shoes temporarily has blown me away, not only as to how organized you are, but also your resourcefulness to make process improvements and deal with new challenges as they come up. Your professionalism and dedication above and beyond what's required and for always being there to assist others does not go unnoticed. For example, when the Friends of the Library needed your uh, expertise on Square, everybody know what Square is? <laughs> uh, you jumped right in and supported the Friends gift shop and book sales. You're a joy to work with, and that's not just coming from me. People I talk to say that you light up the room. You're a can-do person. Um, they describe you as the sunshine of the office. Thank you for all you do, and congratulations on achieving this five-year milestone. Yeah. And here we'll get this certificate to her. Okay. Um, the next person uh, is uh, Leticia Palazzi, adult services manager who is here and is celebrating five years with the library. Uh, her supervisor is uh, Ryan Roy. And Ryan wrote, um, Letty joined the district in July of 2017. In her role as adult services manager, Letty is responsible for overseeing all of the collections, services, and programs that the district offers to our adult community. Letty has done an extraordinary job in this capacity, accomplishing so much for the district over the past five years. She has shown innovation and resilience throughout the many stages of COVA era, era library. Um, she does a great job leading many stages of, oh, let's see. She does an amazing job uh, leading the amazing team of adult service librarians that assist our patrons every day of the week. Letty is known for her customer service. She models impeccable customer service and trains the district staff in this area. She is also a dedicated and collaborative manager serving on numerous teams and committees, including the social media team and the public services cohort. And she um, also chairs or co-chairs several committees, such as the PVLD RightMo Planning Committee, the Programming Committee, and most recently, the Mobile Library Services Squad an army term. Uh, Letty is known, uh, has proven herself an invaluable resource to both PVLD and the patrons that it serves. Thank you, Letty, for your service to the community. And uh, the third person for me is uh, Franklin Fratello, maintenance uh, for five years. He works for Daniel Gutierrez. And following a trend, he's not here because he's home with his wife and his new baby. Uh -huh. um, in the five years, uh, this is what uh, Daniel wrote. In the five years Franklin has been with the district, he's been able to expand his responsibilities and move from maintenance worker one to maintenance worker three. He has taken the lead on projects, including painting of the Peninsula Library and the recent repair of the Malaga Cove Library book drop that was hit by a vehicle. Neither of these projects were easy or straightforward tasks. Franklin is always looking for what he can do for our facilities team and the district 
and works the weekend shifts, often setting up and supporting and cleaning up weddings and large uh, events. I'm fortunate to have him as a part of our team and look forward to working with him over the next five years and beyond. And once again, uh, Daniel says, congratulations on your new baby. Okay, I have the pleasure of starting with Sarah Uten Armstrong, Human Resources Manager, who's celebrating five years, and her supervisor is Jennifer Addington. Um, she's not able to join us this evening. Sarah Uden Armstrong began her career at PVLD in June 2017, and we knew immediately she was going to change the Human Resources Department and the district for the better. Sarah brought a new outlook to HR, one where the employees, volunteers, and patrons were appreciated and appreciated and listened to, where everyone was treated with respect and dignity, and all questions were handled with compassion, consideration, and confidentiality. Sarah is a real go-getter and works tirelessly to create a vibrant and engaging workplace for everyone. She immediately stepped up to help plan the library staff recognition events, from planning our annual staff day and the employee appreciation breakfast to assisting with events like tonight. Sarah is known for her organization and scheduling prowess. And during the, sorry, during the pandemic, she created the very complex staff schedules for the entire district. She organizes all of our staff training, creates the manager on duty schedules, creates and issues the bi-monthly newsletter, manages all the hiring for the district, onboards all of our new employees, and so, so much more. Sarah is an integral part of our leadership team and participates on the safety committee. The incident, the incident response team, the joint labor management committee and acts as a passport agent. In the past five years, we have also had the pleasure of seeing Sarah marry her sweetheart Vince and start a family together, welcoming their son James into the world in December of 2021. It's been a pleasure to work with Sarah and we all look forward to working with her for many years to come. Okay, and next we have Adon Becerra, technical service assistant. That's why I noted that people weren't able to hear because I saw that he is on Zoom. Um, he's celebrating 10 years and his supervisor is Mary Cockman. Um, okay, so Adon's willingness to step in and help where needed is greatly appreciated. He is well liked by staff and has a good rapport with the volunteers from students to seniors that help him in his department. Adon's tech skills are greatly appreciated by TS staff and the Friends of the Library volunteers, especially in the mail room. He is able to calmly resolve difficult issues and come up with some sort of permanent solution, or at least temporarily, until he has more information. Thank you, Adon, for your work in circulation and now in tech services. Next, I have Christian Girk, senior branch clerk, uh, attending in person. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, celebrating 10 years, and his supervisor is Eve Wittenmeyer. During his 10 years working for PVLD, Christian has become a beloved figure in the Malaga Cove community and has received countless commendations from patrons and volunteers. Christian has tirelessly supported the Peninsula Friends of the Library and the Malaga Cove book sale, including most recently serving as an excellent bartender at this year's Oktoberfest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially during the pandemic, with almost all the branches staff on furlough, Christian was instrumental in keeping library services up and running at both buildings. Also during that time, Christian helped to complete a major renovation project at Miraless that included moving all the shelving and books throughout the library. As a movie buff himself, one of Christian's favorite initiatives has been showing classic movies in the Malaga Cove Art Gallery, including providing the guests with popcorn that he makes himself in the popcorn machine. Throughout his tenure at PVLD, Christian has become synonymous with Malaga Cove Library and has been a truly wonderful caretaker for our special historical building and all of its patrons.
Good evening. I'd like to uh, recognize David David Ishizaka, who I believe is joining us via Zoom. Here is what his supervisor, Mary Kaufman, wrote about David. David's job in acquisitions requires a lot of attention to detail and staying on top of orders that patrons are depending on for their reading needs. The librarians appreciate his quick responses to orders when patrons make in inquiries with them. David has great tech skills as well, and de department head Mary Kaufman appreciates his expertise in the acquisitions module in our ILS. She will readily admit that this is her weakest module and that he is the go-to for all order and receiving questions. David has a calm and quiet demeanor and both staff and volunteers enjoy working with him on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, David, for your work in circulation and now in tech services. And so you see it, here's your certificate. And now, Monique Sukimoto is here in person, archivist and adult services librarian, who's been with PVLD for 10 years. Uh, her supervisor, Leticia Polizzi, has written this the following about Monique. Monique Leahy Sugimoto is a great local history librarian and archivist. She is always ready with resources and documents to help you learn the history of your home on the peninsula, find images on what an old road looked like, or help you record an oral history. She has excellent customer service skills, always going above and beyond to, as to assist patrons with their needs. She's an exceptional representative for the library out in the community. Monique is a tremendous asset to PVLD, bringing forth ideas and concepts that help with the overall vision and mission of the library. Congratulations, Monique, on your 10th anniversary and know that you are appreciated. Please join me up here. Too. Joining us via Zoom, I think, is Eric Adams, who is uh, our next honoree. Eric Adams the, is digital services librarian. He's been with PVLD for 15 years, and his supervisor, David Campbell, wrote the following. Time flies so fast. It's been 15 years since you started working here. It has been excellent working alongside you for such a long time. Nothing is more valuable to an employer than an employee who is both loyal and hardworking. I wanted to thank you for your hard work and the loyalty you have shown toward our library. It is very much appreciated. Your unique set of skills and your positive attitude toward your work make you a valuable part of our team. You stood together with us during all the ups and downs of the past couple of years, always showing up at work with a positive attitude and a smile on your face. Congratulations on reaching your 15 year milestone at PVLD. We hope you stay another 15. Thank you. So the first person I'd like to acknowledge is Tommy Pickett. He has been uh, here at PBLD for the past 15 years in the maintenance department. His supervisor is Daniel Gutierrez. He is not in attendance today, and I understand the reason why. Tommy starts his day working his full-time job with the Los Angeles Unified School District. His day with them starts at 6 a.m. And when his LAUSD peers are going home, he's commuting to start his day working here at PBLD. He works as uh, the part-time night cleaning shift at the branches, and his day with us ends at 8.30 p.m. His work has been seen by anyone who has visited the branches in the last 15 years, and really his contribution is uh, appreciated by both the staff and the public. Uh, one of the things that we hear from the public is what a nice place this uh, all of our branches are to visit. Uh, it's got a great ambiance, it's very, very comfortable, and he certainly contributes to that greatly. Uh, what Daniel would like the world to know is that this is in large part because the work that Tommy does alone after the branches close, he's an integral part of the team, and we are all very grateful for the work that he does. 
uh, the team would not be able to accomplish the things that the team does without him. In person, in the room, Victor Cedillo, who is a page with 15 years with the Palos Verdes Library District, his supervisor is Ketsi Diaz. And first of all, congratulations on 15 years with PVLD. What Ketsi would like the world to know is that Victor is a page at the Peninsula Center Library and is on the staff association planning fund staff events and staff recognition programs. Got that out with Tom. On twisters. Uh, Victor is always ready to take on a new project or help another department with a display or program. He is leading our massive biography shifting project and is our go-to evening shift page. Victor has extensive, extensive music and local food knowledge, and we are so lucky to have him here at PVLD to share that knowledge base. Thank you, Victor, for your positive, fun outlook in the circulation department, I'm sure that just makes things a lot more fun. So thank you for again for 15 years with PVLD. And also not in attendance. Larry Tamanaga, senior page with 20 years with the Palos Verdes Library District. Uh, his supervisor is Ketsi Diaz. And what Ketsi would like the world to know is Larry is a senior page at the Peninsula Center Library. And you can always find him in the sorting room, keeping it neat and organized and chatting with patrons who are browsing or need help with their holes or the copy machines. And anyone who has seen nine to five knows all about copy machines. Mm -hmm. Larry is very organized and detail oriented and can always be counted on to take on a project and get it done accurately and efficiently. Larry also works with our volunteers and his optimistic outlook, fun spirit and kindness make for a wonderful environment for our volunteers. Larry keeps us all laughing in circulation with his puns, his jokes, great stories about his artistic adventures, his birds, and other wildlife encounters. And with 20 years, he might be old enough to tell dad jokes. Uh, what would PBLD be without Larry? Thank you, Larry. Um, even though you're not with us physically, I'm sure you're here with us in spirit. And um, I'm the only thing standing between you and cake. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And I believe we have some refreshments. And if you could stay and... Um, enjoy for a little bit. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Take a little break. Yes. <laughs> break for cake. <laughs> Sugar. <laughs> It was good. It was good. No. Uh, basically, Mike never remembered that. Uh, so basically, I don't get a picture of the sister that uh, it's on. It's usually close to a family gathering. Yeah. It is now. Yeah. Yeah. I said yeah. you need to go back to Monday. It's okay. It's fine. Yeah. Well, there's another story. There's another story for that. So, anyways, I basically said. And so you can. Andy was using a picture. Oh, flash, flash. Yeah. So I saw. Yeah. Well, and then I got. I got a show. And I said, yeah, if, if they, they were seen, my basic plan is in the morning, you take the elevator down, have breakfast, you go walk around, and then walk to the family. One of us can hang out with mom while we're at the other, we hope to follow. 
if you don't mind coming back, um, and we're going to start recording. Uh, I guess do wonderful. So those are mm -hmm. old messages, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no yeah. Are we ready to resume? Okay. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, what a wonderful ceremony, and I'm um, grateful for all the trustees uh, for to all the trustees for participating. Um, next up on the agenda, we have item eleven: quarterly report from the Peninsula Friends of the Library. Uh, Colleen Cotter, Direct, uh, Executive Director Cotter, uh, could not join us tonight. Um, so, and I, um, I guess I'm technically still the friends liaison for this last meeting. So she did, uh, we do have a copy of her report. I'll just go over it quickly. Um, the endowment fund is now totals over 5 million as of December 31st. Um, audit uh, appears to be going smoothly. Um, the friends approved the request for 35,000 by the library to study the feasibility of extending the proposed patio area. And that's also on the, uh, uh, one of the items on the agenda. Um, uh, the annual appeal has raised uh, $136,000 so far. It's an increase of 21,000 over last year. Um, the friends launched the Palace Verdes coloring poster and I have to show you. If you haven't seen it, it is uh, wonderful. I gave it out as gifts this year and people have been coloring all over the country. Um, uh, Colleen is preparing for the third literary weekend. Uh, I am on that committee and um, the weekend is gonna kick off April 28th uh, with um, Patty Sullivan's newest book about Betty White. Um, there's going to be weekend activities for children, for young adults, and uh, uh, adults. Um, almost, they're almost, uh, the friends are almost done with their strategic plan. Um, and the gift shop uh, managed by Susan Fall Paul continues to grow, and they're planning more pop-up events throughout the peninsula, which has been very successful. Book sales are very are vibrant. Um, uh, the sales um, total over uh, a, uh, from July to December 2022 uh, totaled over 72,000. Um, lastly, there was some water damage in the PC parking garage where I guess the books are, the used books, and um, but uh, staff moved 150 boxes to the center of the parking area to avoid. Um, uh, the books uh, that damaged the books. Uh, so that is uh, Colleen's report. Anybody have any questions, comments? Do you know how the pop-ups work? I believe um, it's taking the library shop to events like uh, the Malaga Cove Library when it has its um, uh, used book sale. The library will go to the location and do a little pop up and have sales and I believe it's been tremendously successful. So I think they're planning to do more of that kind of pop up. Yeah, it started um, at Malaga, particularly at the Malaga Cove Library during their book sale weekend. Mm -hmm. um, when the weather was nice, facilities set up a table and a pop up tent. Mm -hmm. And Susan Paul, the manager of the library shop, brought over a sort of curated collection of um, uh, material and put it all on display and it really promoted the library shop as a place to go uh, mm -hmm. as somewhere that sold cards and jewelry and trinkets and all kinds of wonderful gift ideas so when the weather got a little bit worse they um, spoke to the managers of the Malaga Cove book sale there on site and found an area that they could actually move inside Mm -hmm. So hopefully they'll be able to do a pop-up library shop every weekend that there is a Malaga Cove book sale. And then maybe try and also get that out into the community and other little places. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it's a, it's a, it, you know, it takes a little bit of organization and definitely it takes the traveling of the table and the chairs and the tent and whatnot, but um, kind of working alongside facilities, they're looking to see if they can get that out there a little bit more. Thanks. It's a good uh, promotional and, and yeah. uh, marketing tool as well. Mm -hmm. Trustee Easton. Yes. So not to put you on the spot, uh, because I was the friends liaison before you were the friends liaison. Um, when they first started the endowment, they had their initial goal and then they had their next milestone. So I think that if the uh, endowment has reached 5 million, have they set a new milestone for them to reach for? I, I don't, don't think, think so. Okay. Um, They're debating. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and there was no, there was a meeting in December, I believe. I, I don't think I attended that one. No, I attended it. You attended it on my they, behalf. They, they, you reported on it. Yeah, I they remember. Talked about it, but they didn't yeah. reach any conclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, the markets were turbulent. They're still turbulent. So mm -hmm. maybe they want to wait for things to settle down before. Yeah, and they are, as maybe was stated in that report, they are looking for a professional manager to manage the money now that it's gotten to the level I, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do remember that they, they have a discussed that. 500000 mm -hmm. Uh, in their uh, operating fund. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Right. I did not mention that they have over 500000 in their operating fund as of December 31st. Um, begun research uh, or begun the search for professional assistance in managing financial assets. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. We'll move on to the next item then, which is the facilities update. Um, facilities manager Gutierrez. He's coming over right now. Okay. I just saw him right here, so I was expecting him to be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Daniel. Hello. I figure everybody kind of hears me a little bit better um, via this, everyone that's uh, attending Zoom as well. Oh, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> we'll start with the annex. Um, you know, we've had weather delays. Uh, we have been able to um, accelerate our inspection schedule. Uh, Rolling Hills, the city of Rolling Hills has actually hired their own inspector full time now. Um, they probably got a lot of kickback from what the county had done and scheduled for every Thursday inspection. So that's actually helped, uh, helped us greatly since that uh, changed hands back to the city. Um, we did have an inspection today for the forms and rebar, which we passed, and we are scheduled to pour the foundation for the entryway next Tuesday, and we'll also be working on some of the flooring uh, next week as well, and starting the structured cabling the week after that, um, hopefully. Um, so we are on track for uh, end of February completion for it right now. Um, contingent on the poor, we're scheduled for Tuesday and we're crossing fingers that we continue to, you know, stay on that because that's really been the big holdup uh, as of recent. So um, <clears throat> we're excited about that. Um, in the neighborhoods, we have had two trees identified. Um, one tree at Merrill Less, that was an ash tree. Um, the neighbors, you know, first brought up the fact that it kind of blocking some of their view and it's also on a little bit of a slope so it could be a safety hazard with a lot of the rain that we got and so they asked us to kind of trim it back but if we're trimming back every couple of years it's going to be you know a, a, a little bit of a, a fiscal challenge for us to, to continue to do that for that tree so we've opted to speak to the neighbors around and i'll be delivering letters on monday but the neighbors that i spoke to all would rather have it removed then trim back as well. So that's going to be something that's happening at Merrill Last. Um, and then over at Malaga Cove, the pine tree as you're entering the driveway for the parking lot is starting to die off. Um, the top half of it is, is dead. And um, we talked to the city forestry um, and they recommended that we remove the tree. They're also just today removed one of the pine trees in the park um, for the same issue. It had died off completely. So those are things that I'm going to be delivering neighbor um, letters to the neighborhood just to notify them on the dates and um, have my contact information for them to, you know, reach out if they have any questions or concerns. Um, there's been a lot of rain and there have been a lot of leaks. Um, so we've been 
going through and mitigating it. Um, we'll fix a branch and it'll be okay. And then the next rainstorm will come through and um, there'll be another leak here and there. So we're looking at the causes of those things and trying to mitigate them and repair them while it's dry. And um, so we, that is a um, continuing. Um, that's, that's about it for the facilities that we've got going forward. Um, mainly been concentrating on the leaks and uh, the annex recently. So to clarify, um, the county basically laid off their inspectors and they subcontracted to outside contractors and Rolling Hills has hired inspectors to receive all the building inspection requests within the city. Correct. They hired a full-time inspector who does inspections Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then office work Monday and Friday. That's a pretty impressive commitment on the part of the city. Yes. Um, and I'm sure they got a lot of kickback because it delayed every project in the city of Rolling Hills because they were, you know, counting on the inspections from the county. So um, walking around and talking to the other projects, I was seeing what the impact was and uh, everybody was pretty upset about it. So I think the city got the hint and um, they hired their own full-time inspector. And that's that's exciting for any project that we have moving forward. What, what was the procedure before the once a week uh, uh, limited inspector? Wasn't it that the city had its own inspector at that point or no? No, um, their plan check and inspection went through the County of Los Angeles. Um, so if you if you had an inspection that was coming up, what you would do is you would call the county of Los Angeles and before they outsourced it, it was basically like the next day, oh. the day after, if you were unlucky, that they would show up for the inspection so you could keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, but then when they transitioned to a third party inspection, mm -hmm. that's when they changed it to in this area. It's only on Thursdays. There's a limited amount of slots. If you don't get one, then it's pushed off to the next week. And so it really sure. slowed down a lot of projects because you function as let's get that inspected and move on because you can't, there's a lot of things that you can't do until certain processes are inspected as, as you go. Um, so, you know, you're, you're waiting a week at a complete standstill because you need something inspected before you could move on rather than a day or two. Um, and then you could schedule around a day or two, but you can't schedule it out in a week when you're moving like that. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work going around in the library. So going and talking to those construction crews, there was a lot of upset uh, foremans and project managers about that. So everybody's really happy that uh, the city hired a full-time inspector. So I'd like to say thank you as well. Looking yeah. forward to with him. Uh, aside from those trees that you mentioned, um, you know, we hear these stories where, there were perfectly healthy trees, but because the soil suddenly became super saturated and soft, they started to become unstable. Um, we don't have any of those, do we? We do not. Um, I've been running around uh, the district a lot over the last couple of weeks with the amount of rain that we've got. Um, we had some runoff on the hill from, from Merrill West. Um, we kind of backfilled that and, and triaged it so that it wouldn't continue in that area. And we're going to be working on some of the irrigation uh, lines on that side to, to recover them and ensure up. So make sure that some of the hill doesn't fall off into the drainage area. Um, we've been checking all the eucalyptus trees that are on our properties and the pine trees and, and everything else daily. Um, while it was raining, I was going around to every property and making sure we weren't seeing any soil separation or leaning of trees or, you know, masses amount of runoff because most of our, our properties are on hills. Um, so it's the rain has been keeping us very busy because um, we're you know very conscious of those kind of threats. Anything else, Daniel? I mean, facilities manager Gutierrez. <laughs> <laughs> um, as as far as the facilities updates, we've been concentrating on um, you know making sure that there's not rain damage, triaging the things that have been having the leaks over the last month, and concentrating on making sure that the annex keeps moving forward. Um, so um, we have got a couple other things, but they're also agendized. So we'll talk about them in the agenda as we as we get coming forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, next item is Peninsula Center Entryway Redesign and Contract Director Addington and Facilities Manager Gutierrez. 
Yeah, we're definitely going to tackle this one um, together. And um, I know we'll have a little bit of conversation about it. So I'll just start off by saying you have a memo in your packet about a little bit of the background. <clears throat> but basically, we've been working with um, uh, Cozen Architecture and Lighting now for uh, several months on a redesign of the entryway here at the Peninsula Center Library on the Deep Valley side. We've also spoken to them about the possibility of building uh, an addition terrace, patio, deck, whatever you want to call it on the west side of the library. It's basically in a small piece of property that's between us and the Merrill Gardens facility. So it would be um, coming out flat from our entryway right at the main glass doors of the Peninsula Center Library. It's off to, if you're looking at the front door from the street, it's off to the left-hand side and it would be building a deck there. So what we received in the past from Cozen was, um, um, illustrative drawings and a conceptual drive-through or uh, kind of fly-through video of what it could be out there. Um, we have not received actual plans, blueprints, uh, detailed plans. And that's where we would like to go now. So Daniel asked, and Daniel, if any time, if I'm um, incorrect, please jump in. But in conversation with um, Cozen Architecture and Lighting, Daniel asked them to uh, quote us to produce detailed drawings that could take us all the way to permitting and construction for the entryway project. And then a second set that would be for the terrace patio build out. So you see two contracts in your um, packet, one for the, the basic entryway, and then one that's for the terrace. The terrace, weirdly enough, is uh, slightly more expensive because it's an actual structural build where the entryway is the ground covering needing to be all taken up and kind of re-put down, but there's no structural build where the, the patio terrace would have to be an actual structural build. So we went to the friends. Um, one of the reasons that we've even thought about this terrace option is while the staff has for many years thought, boy, that would be really neat. It would be really great to have additional outdoor seating. We knew that it would be a fairly expensive project and we didn't ever think that the library really had the funding to move forward with it. But after the friends received a fairly sizable donation, they were looking for something that could be a naming. And this build, this terrace, could be a named opportunity for them. So we went to the friends um, and explained what this could be. Um, we showed them the drawings and we showed them the uh, conceptual video and asked if they would be willing to pay for the... Uh, terrace items. Yeah, the, the print. The terrace blueprints. Yeah, the blueprints of the terrace to be created. And they, at their last um, meeting, said yes, that they would be willing to fund that up to an amount of $35,000. But we, as the Palos Verdes Library District, would be the ones engaging the architect, and we would simply bill back the friends for that portion of the cost. So what we'd like tonight is to have a conversation about moving forward, what that might look like. Um, talk about the contract and basically get your feedback on where and how we might move forward with this project. What? And Daniel, is there anything more that you'd like to add or? Um, I mean, of course, we'll answer your questions as well. I really, um, so Cozen Architecture came through as a recommendation from um, Colleen Carter from the Friends and it was something that she's very interested in doing for the library. Um, she's been part of the library. Um, she went to high school up here and she used to use the library as a teenager. Her mom was a member of the Friends and I believe a, a board member for a period of time. Um, she's part of the art jury in PVE. Um, she's very embedded in the community. And uh, this is a project that she's, she's doing a lot for us, um, given the price that she's quoting us. And this is for support through construction. 
Um, so it's not just the blueprints. This would also continue until the project is completed. Granted, you know how many changes we say or how often they come out. So um, you know, thirty-five or sixty-five thousand dollars for blueprints for a project of this scale is ex extremely favorable. We're basically getting it for cost. Um, we really love her conceptual designs of the way that it looks, their, their ideas that they have. Um, and in communications with them, they've been very, very good to work with. Um, so, you know, having them come up, help us with this project for me personally has got me, you know, excited to go through the project with them because of um, how detail oriented, how excited they are, and they're vested in it. And, and they're also, you know, doing a large favor for the district by basically doing it for cost. So um, yeah, that's just, I just wanted to interject that much. Very quick in response to that, and this might be a rhetorical question. Um, you know, we, we have had some persistency problems in the past, even as recent with regards to architecture, architects that we worked with for the um, uh, uh, the annex. Mm -hmm. so we have confidence that this organization is gonna be persistent. They're gonna be, you know, uh, the, the principles are gonna still be there, all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, when you start a project, that's how you feel about everybody. Um, <laughs> so you don't really wanna work, uh, you know, enter into a work relationship with somebody that you don't feel that way. Um, and so I, I do feel like, they are have been very responsive. They feel vested in the project, um, and and their contract says that they are going to support through completion. They do list out how many site visits and how many questions. They also um, list out how many revisions um, on the blueprints themselves. So it's a detailed contract. But um, yeah, I, I really do like their excitement for the project and the vision that they have. Um, I think goes along with you know, our strategic principles and the way that we you know operate as a district. So um, yes, I've they have been uh, good to work with up to this point. But yeah, I mean we're welcome and and we truly do welcome any questions or concerns um, about you know the contract or the agency or just the process of how we move forward with this project. Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, we've kind of seen some conceptuals. We've talked to them. Um, you know, they, they've had some ideas that were a little too much for us. You know, they, they had some kind of like really flowery stuff that looked beautiful, but was maybe not quite as, as um, you know, sturdy as we wanted for a public library building. But they've also been incredibly accommodating about saying, all right, great. Well, we're going to take that one out. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier for us to now go in and say, okay, you know, don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and draw these, you know, get us these plans so that then we can go and actually have the project bid. Mm -hmm. So far, we're, you know, we've not spent a great deal of money on this project, but it ultimately will be a, a several hundred thousand dollar project, just the entryway. Yes. And as we've said the additional terrace actual construction could be as high as $450,000. Those are some of the quotes that we've gotten, but we can't get a proper quote until we have the plans. So it's just the next step. And we're, you know, looking to you guys now. Any kind of design that we ask for, can it be done kind of like in a modular way where it's saying, you know, we can do this, but this extra piece will, like a terrace, for example, will break the bank. So therefore we can't do that. Well, that's exactly why we had them do two plans. There's the entryway plan and the terrace plan. Okay. So if it turns out that the terrace plan is something that is just, just, just becomes too cost prohibitive for even the friends to take on, if they look at it and they yeah. decide, no, you know what, we were willing to do 35,000 in order to find out what this is going to cost because we want a long-term substantial naming opportunity for this big donor. But if the cost comes back, that's just exorbitant, we can simply not do it. We'd have the plans forever. So maybe sometime down the road said, 
you know, if another donor should show up and give us a million dollars, maybe we would do it then, mm -hmm. but we could not do it and still move forward with the entryway. Yeah, correct. So and then there's, there's certain aspects of it that we can itemize out and ask for particular pricing when we're building the RFI. So that if we say, yeah, you know, those, those doors in the foyer that go directly to the terrace, they're a great idea, but they're just cost prohibitive. Let's take that out. You know, so those are the line items that, that um, we're going to, we're already talking about um, having itemized so that when we're reviewing the proposals and the cost breakdowns in the back end, those are things that we can take out. Just so I understand, the entryway um, uh, funds, it, it's already in our budget. Correct. Correct. And uh, how long will the um, will it take to get these conceptual drawings? Do you, do you have a time we frame? Ha we have the conceptual renderings. Um, once we, I do not have a time frame from them. Once we sign the contract, when we, how long it'll take to get them, it will be a period of a couple of months because they need to go through and do some engineering. Um, and then, and then at that point, we'll give it to the city. Um, we've also been talking to the contractor that is doing the annex currently, um, so that we can kind of, you know, share the plans as they go along so that they can give us a little bit of input on um, things that could help us um, fiscally and timeline and uh, you know try to keep it within our budgetary constraints because the architect you know they're going to put down a dream but the contractor is going to give us a, a price on that dream and we'll be able to dial things back where we need to during the design so that it's more likely that we'll be able to attack, attack the project at the very end so um, those are all conversations that we've been having with um, mzn and cozen um, yeah. So that we could all, as three entities, work together to try to make sure that this project is, you know, cost efficient at the end. But just for clarity, MZM is being, you know, very generous with their time and very yeah. generous with their information Correct. and expertise. But when and if the time comes that we actually put out an RFP to contractors, we will bid for this project. Correct. Nobody has this project. Yeah. There is no guarantee. Again, the relationship that we've built with MZN, you know, they have been very generous with their expertise, but um, but we will definitely, this is a biddable project. It is an RFP. It's yeah. going to go out to everyone. They are just being very helpful since they have a project with us and they look forward to the opportunity to try to bid it just like with everybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, the only comment I would go ahead and say, you know, and it's the last comment I'll make is I've never been a fan of East German architecture. Uh, but all I'm saying is that um, as you guys go through this process, uh, you know, keep in mind durability and low cost of maintenance right. <laughs> over the long term. Well, and I think those are exactly some of the things that we've already talked a little bit with the architects. You know, again, somebody comes in and they're they're a designer and they see all the wonderful things. I, I think we shared with you that one of the design elements that they brought forward was um, a string of lights, sorry, mm. a, a lighting strip that would go from the sidewalk all the way to the main entrance, but embedding lights into the brick design is first of all, very expensive mm. and adds a breakable element to mm. your design that we just didn't want. And in looking at it, yes, it looks beautiful, mm -hmm. but we just don't want that. But one of the things that they were able to do is say, well, what if we, and it would be the same cost, just created like a, a design brick, just a, just a different color brick that would give us a little bit of a design element to it. So they're very understanding. They absolutely appreciate that we're a public library, that our funding is not, um, you know, endless. Mm -hmm. And they also understand that this entryway, part of the design element of it is that the individual bricks will be able at some point down the road to be carved as a fundraising opportunity for the friends. Mm -hmm. So when you see those um, facilities, I think even the Point Vicente Interpretive Center has like engraved bricks or there's a lot of places where you've seen the engraved bricks. It's something that Colleen Cotter, the executive director of the Friends, has really um, uh, is very excited about having that opportunity here. 
Um, we have not talked about this, but I'm just going to throw it out there too that, you know, at some point, if we move forward with the entryway and the brick design on the Deep Valley side, it, you know, a, a future project would be to do that brick design on the Silver Spur side. I was just going because to ask that. Right now, mm -hmm. if you see the Silver Spur side of the library, there's already sort of a break in the marble mm -hmm. because we, the city requires and understandably um, an ADA accessible ramp and, and access between the, um, uh, the curbs. They put in a better curb. But when they broke that out and put in the, the curbing and all up and down Silver Spur, they certainly didn't replace it with Italian marble. Um, the design of taking Italian marble all the way to the end of the sidewalk was a design element at the time, 20 years ago, um, but it's not a great design element going forward. So it could be that you know this is the first thing that we do we do the bricks we look at the design and maybe in a few years we'll want to look at that side mm -hmm. and and match it so it's just something to think about going forward so part of the element of the deep valley design then is nothing custom the bricks aren't specially designed bricks from you know, only one brick vendor in the Midwest, they're easily accessible, you know, yeah, we're not there, we can replace them, we can buy them, they're not a special size that you would potentially go out of stock. So part of the intent is to create a space that can be repaired mm -hmm. easily, can, you know, we can just handle those things on our own because- it is not slippery as well. And um, yeah. right now that we're on expansion soil. So like with the rain, we've we've expanded a lot. That that whole walkway's gone up. Oops. That you see on the um uh, my camera just went a little haywire. Can you still hear me? We yes, can. you're a little you. muted, but we can hear you. Okay. My uh, screen for whatever reason, my camera just turned it off. And I'm not sure exactly sure why, but I'll continue. Um, Sounds like you're in a well. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Uh... It looks like you're in that listening station at the local history center. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could hear well, you, Daniel. If you can hear me, I'll just continue on. Um, you know, so this, the stone cracks on that side. And what we've been having to do is remove it and just fill it with concrete so that it's not a hazard. But part of this design is is with paver stones, so we'll be able to, you know, remove a section, regrade it, and then put the paver stones back exactly as they were, so that we can continue to repair it and it doesn't mess with the aesthetics of the walkway as well. Um, there will also be a lot more grippy than what we have now. They, those uh, do get a little bit slippery when it's uh, when it's wet coming down Deep Valley. So there's those are the two main things that identified this project to begin with. But as we started looking at it and brainstorming, that's part of the paver stones is being able to etch it as a fundraising opportunity for the friends. And then the terrace came up and we're, we're talking about like 14,000 stones um, that we're gonna be putting in. So there's, there's quite a bit in this design. We've also dialed back some things because in the planters, they wanted to put this really nice white gravel down and then maybe have some seating areas. And, <laughs> Um, during the meeting, Jennifer and I were like, no, there's no gravel that needs to be, you know, compressed granite, or it needs to be a hardscape because, you know, kids and slipping and rocks through windows and all of the reasons. So, you know, those are things that we have kind of adjusted through the design element uh, during the process where we're getting the, you know, renderings together and all that as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Daniel. And I know, I mean, one of the things that um, uh, Trustee Park mentioned is at in the contract itself, you know, it says that um, we'll design a water feature, we'll design a safety rail, we'll design a water-wise irrigation system. Any of these things, you know, trees that sycamores, old growth, we'll design all these things. Any of those things that don't fit our plan, um, we'll just simply remove. Mm -hmm. I don't think we really 
I don't think any of that would change the price of the quote. Well, I'm, I'm not so concerned about, well, I guess I am concerned about that because if I, the way I read the contract changes, you know, they, they say they've already given us a schematic and they're going to do the design based on the schematic. And if we make significant changes to that, to that design, there's a fairly hefty cost for that built into the contract. And so we haven't seen the schematics, the friends haven't seen the schematics, and I'm a little concerned about that. I, I guess I have a slight, oh, go ahead, Daniel. After we, after we would sign the contract to move forward, we would have a, a few robust meetings about expectations on the things that we would want to remove in order for those schematics to be um, drawn up. Because to this date, the only thing that we have are the renderings and conceptuals of what the design would be. Okay, but there's a, there's a conflict there, Daniel, because it says the schematics are completed. Yeah. And can uh, you reference that in the, the contract? It's on 13.3. Um, uh, it's the very top. 13.3. 13 13 mm -hmm. Page 13.3. Schematic design. I mean, I guess I don't, I, I understand that they're saying a schematic has been completed. We have not seen a schematic. What we have seen are just the arc or just the illustrative designs and the dry and the fly through. I don't, I mean, our conversations with Cozen have been really productive. And I know that every conversation that we've ever had with them, and especially with um, the owner of the organization of the, of the um, company, she's been so accommodating and so willing to make these um, adjustments for us. I understand your concern, um, Trustee Park, I absolutely do. I worry that, I mean, if, if the board so chooses, we could certainly go back to them, have them adjust the contract and bring it back next month. Mm -hmm. I think our concern is just that it further delays the project that we do have funded in this fiscal year if we can move forward with it. Well, my question um, would be, if, now that you know the concern, is it possible for you to go ahead and we give you action that you can act as long as you address the concern expressed? Sure. I mean, yeah, that's up to the board. But yeah, I mean, I think we know to kind of to, uh, to uh, Trustee Park's point, you know, going back to Cozen Architecture and saying, okay, well, first of all, you're saying here that you've given us a, a schematic. That's not true. The only thing we've seen is uh, drawings. Um, I think either they would say, and I'm not sure they would say this, but I'm, you know, oh, well, that's kind of what we meant. You've seen drawings. Then that it's should like, be well, clear. Then, then, then. Change, mm -hmm. then change the language to say that. Well, um, as I said, uh, built into that contract are uh, pretty hefty fees for changes. In other yeah, words, changes to the plans. They no, haven't done no. the plans yet. Correct. Well, they're, they're, but they're going to make the way it's written, they're going to make the plans based on the schematics that they say they've already delivered. So maybe and what so we're looking it's just it, it having sat in uh friends meetings mm -hmm. regarding the annex uh, you know a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and i i think that it would be beneficial to us to have this nailed down okay and not tell the friends hey we took it on faith mm -hmm. um, i'm not so worried about our part of it but i am worried about signing i'm really worried about signing off on the way the the uh, terrace part of it works. Right. Looks right now, just the way it's written. It it sounds to me that we need clarity on the schematics completed and whether, if they have not been, maybe there's a misunderstanding of what that means. Clarify what schematics does that include? Is that the um, renderings? Or is this something else? And if it's something else and they need that in order to proceed, is that gonna cost more? Is that gonna be a per hour thing or is that already included in the price? And I think if we get clarity on that, are you comfortable moving forward? Or well, I, I, think, I think I am. I would like to talk to some of the members of the Friends board about it too and show them that we told the finalists and they're saying, we agreed to pay 35,000 the way it reads now. 
uh, there's going to be a water feature in it. See, I, I would disagree with you. No, I no, think no, no, it's, it's, it's right in writing. I'm just saying, if your friends read that contract, they're paying for a design that includes a water feature. And if we change, and if after Cozen comes back with a water feature in there and they change it, they're going to be charged more. It, it, I, I realize what you're saying, and I think you're probably right. Right. But it's not a professional way to do it. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we could handle it one of three ways. We could delay this until February. Yeah. We can go ahead and direct you to go ahead and say, if you can alleviate those concerns, you can go ahead and proceed. The other option is if you could go ahead and alleviate it, we could have a special meeting just before the budget workshop to go ahead and you can say, hey, we were able to clarify the point very quickly. And this is now satisfy you. And then that'll be a very, very short conversation. So well, I don't um, think we could get it by next week. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's already it's Thursday, already Thursday and our yeah. meeting is Tuesday. Um, yeah, I mean, I would be willing to do either one of those, whichever. Um, I mean, we could delay it until we could go back to Cozen, ask for some clarity on the contracts, um, remove the water feature, find out what schematic means, and then bring it back in February. Um, or we could do that with the understanding that if we get that clarity, the board is okay with us signing a contract with Cozen, whichever one you want. Well, there's, okay. there's a, a slight other, maybe a 1A or 2A, something like that. It's really two contracts. Yes, it's two contracts. So well, I, I'm, I think you probably, you know, I would have faith that we're, we're on good shape with our part of it, the entryway part of it. Um, so maybe we sign that contract and get going on that uh, if the rest of the board feels okay with that, even though we haven't seen the schematics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we do need a side conversation with them about that. And then um, scrub the contract on the terrace to remove things like a water feature, okay, and so on that are in there right now. Um, and also in, in the December meeting, what the, the friends wanted was the schematics, you know, the sort of the conceptual design, which mm -hmm. they haven't seen yet. Uh, I know that some of them have said, hey, we'd like a better entryway from Merrill Gardens onto the terrace. And I don't know if that's in there or not. Who said that? Uh, several of the friend board members at the meeting. So, well, I mean, I, I can I, honestly tell you that's the first I've ever heard of an entryway from Merrill Gardens. All that, all that tells me is that we're missing some communication. Well, well, I guess the question not, I not have an is... Entry, not an entryway from Merrill Gardens, but you know how the Merrill Gardens yeah. pathway comes up to the side and it goes all the way around to the, the regular entrance to the library? Yeah. Okay, well, if we have a terrace there and there's a... Uh, like you know a, a fence on that walkway why not just put a gate in that fence so you can go right onto the terrace that's what they're asking i don't think it's going to connect well yeah i think we need to we need to talk about a few of those things with them before we we go we go into this process then Okay. Well, it sounds like the friends contract is the one that has some questions attached to it. So are we ready to uh, make a motion uh, for the entryway contract? Um, and what would that motion be? Well, I mean, um, it would be something like... Uh, approve the uh, entryway contract with the proviso that the staff uh, clarifies with uh, Cozen the, what they mean by a completed schematic. And um, are we going to have an opportunity to change the preliminary 
you know, set of uh, designs that they give us without an uh, extra charge. And then as far as the, um, the friends go, I should think- Should we, should we uh, vote on that? Well, I mean, somebody else may have a better idea than I have. Yeah. Well, do you want to start with the recommended action and then adjust what's written there as the recommended action? So the recommended action, uh, well, I think we have, to, we have to adjust it though, because- Yeah, that's what I was saying. So start there, but make adjustments to what is proposed. So it says here, I mean, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little torn because I feel like the recommended action is going to have so many caveats to it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that maybe, Daniel, we would be better to just go back to Cozen, talk mm -hmm. about this contract and see if we can get an updated contract and bring it back in February. Yeah, I think we should we can pull them together and have another, you know, hopefully face to face meeting about it. Yeah. Um, and then maybe we can have a little bit more of an idea of what some of the friends suggestions are going into that meeting as well so that we can you know get you know mind our p's and q's during that meeting to set the expectation um of exactly you know what the original what the first schematics are going to be that are coming out um and yeah. you know that's that's usually something that you do after engaging in contract because then those those kinds of conversations are covered in the cost in the contract in the initial parts of it. So we might need to pay them for their time when they come out when we're still talking about that. She might not, but that is a possibility. Just wanted to, you know, be clear about that. And can I ask that when when it comes back, you know, since they said that the schematics were completed, if we could have, you know, a link or access to, you know, even if it's something we've already received mm -hmm. so that it reminds us of what we've seen before, because I know it's been a while since we, you know, because I vaguely remember mm -hmm. seeing the fly through. Mm -hmm. Well, Daniel, remember this came up in the December uh, friends meeting. Mm -hmm. Hey, do we have a, you know, preliminary schematics? And you said, no, no we don't. No. Well, all we have is the renderings. Like that we do. So they're going to jump all over that. Okay. Well, I mean, I feel like we probably go back to Cozen. So mm -hmm. let's, go, let's go back to them and talk to them about the contract and find out if that's in fact what they mean or if what they meant was you've seen our designs, in our illustrations, You've seen the fly through, and that's what they were envisioning. Yeah. Are the illustrations part of that fly through email that we got, or is are the illustrations different? Uh, no, uh, separate. We have static illustrations. Yeah, that they mm -hmm. share. And and we that have we, that we originally shared with the fly through. Yes. Yeah. The with the fly through. Okay. We, we shared both of those. I vaguely remember okay. that. Yes. Originally. Yes. How long ago was that? It's well before. Yeah, you may so have, you have, have seen, seen it, seen Jonathan. It. So yeah. we'll send we'll send it about again. Yeah, that's why I was suggesting that if you know if we could pull together everything that we've had previously, I think that'll help. Okay. With the discussion. Yeah. And I and I think on the said on on the the terrorist side, um, you know, we ought to eliminate. Before we can go back to the friends, we got to eliminate the water feature part of it. Well, the way I read the water feature part is that this it's it's under the scope, and so I, I the way I read it is that once the contract is signed, this is these are the things to be considered. Uh, so that's my understanding. But again, clarification on that would be yeah. good. That's that's my understanding of the contract as well. I think it's more of a cookie cutter thing. Um, because there is no water feature in the conceptual drawings. Not or even the ones that they gave us or mm -hmm. the fly through. Right. So I think it's just kind of a standard contract that these are some of the things that we would talk about and we would just remove them. Well, right. then it shouldn't even be able to begin with. Because all it's going to do is raise issues and uh, concerns. Okay. 
but the safety railing will is part of the yeah, that yeah. would that would need to be included yes that would need to be included and the other details are specific to this project um i think what they did is they took their general contract of things that they have run into in the past mm -hmm. and those are things that they have in every contract to cover themselves they don't necessarily mean that they're going to be included in this project that's moving forward. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we could have them remove and sharpen their pencils. Um, and it'll just be in conversation where we can say, you know, we do realize that this is probably part of your cookie cutter side of things, but it might cause some confusion when we're talking about it and delivering this to, um, you know, two separate boards. And, you know, we'll just work with them to remove those and dial it in a little bit better. Well, I think sure. that is already caused creation, uh, confusion. So <laughs> I think it's obvious that there's some confusion. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Okay, we can do that. So are we clear then on this item that staff will go back and um, clarify some of the terms of the contract then and come back to uh, the board at the next meeting? For both contracts? I think so, for both, yeah. I think it would make sense for both, yes. And I think I think we ought to hopefully we'll be able to have a chance to talk to the friends too about the terrorist contract just to see if they have any questions. I think that's just a courtesy since they're paying for it. Yes, I believe I think that we should have their feedback before we walk into a meeting with Cozen. Yeah. Yeah, especially if they're talking about things that they've not shared with us, would that would be a good idea. We want to yep. make sure we're covering everything. Mm -hmm. They may so. love a water feature. <laughs> yeah, we're going to nix that one. Though. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Budgetary cost. Yeah. All, all I could say uh, is going maintenance. All I could say is maintenance. Oh, water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we have a little bit of a, a I mean, obviously, we have a, a duty to look at this. I mean, we're, we're sort of agents for the friends on this contract. So we really have to um, make sure that their uh, understanding and their wishes are expressed in the contract as well. I agree. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is item 14, strategic plan update, Director Addington. Thank you. So strategic plan update. In this first year of our three-year plan, our 2022-2025 strategic principles, are working very well for the district and are all being adopted into the daily activities of almost every library department. Several staff have added our new mission statement to their email addresses, and we include it on all of our board agendas. I've gotten very good feedback from community members and from other library professionals who really appreciate our mission statements inspirational and collaborative message. And I think it helps us all as we move forward in um, offering amazing library services. When staff look to create new programs or adopt new initiatives, we look to our strategic principles and we ask ourselves, do these fit into our values? Do they fit into our priorities? And then we look at our internal action plan and we ask, does this achieve a listed action item? And if not, should we create one? And if it doesn't fit our values, if it doesn't fit our principles, if it's not on our action plan, then maybe we let this particular thing go. All of these important documents have given the staff a framework for reviewing our programming, our services, our outreach, and looking at how we enhance our facilities, which is exactly what we had intended and wanted them to do. And they also give some guidance to our community organizations and patrons who want to partner with the library. The programming team actually just updated our online program request form to include a connection to our strategic principles. And we now ask potential program creators, how does your program align with our values and our priorities? And how does it contribute to creating a space for celebration and exploration of diversity, equity, and inclusion? So these things clearly illustrate what we feel is important to the community and then what our expectations are for library programs. And it highlights our values and priorities as people come to us looking to partner and do outreach and programming. So many of the successes that our staff have done, many of the accomplishments that they've made, um, I note in my monthly report, 
And just this last month, I noted a few of them. So in alignment with our value of creating a welcoming space for all and a goal of creating more diverse collections, we've added young reader titles in Armenian and adult titles in Chinese and simplified Chinese and Korean. And we've even established a new Korean language vendor using our own staff as language specialists. We recognize our staff now who speak a language other than English, and we're creating methods for the public to quickly identify who those staff members are too, with buttons that highlight what language they may speak. We have a community survey online now. We've already gotten a number of submissions through that uh, from our patrons expressing their needs and wants. And all of that allows us to better meet their expectations around what the library has as far as collections, what we provide in services, and how we utilize our spaces. And then as part of our commitment to foster a collaborative, supportive, and communicative work environment, which is in fact one of our stated priorities, our staff have created an internal Masters of Library and Information Science development program. So this is for current PVLD employees who are attending an MLS program right now or are just out of library school and it gives them an opportunity to learn more about all aspects of a public library. Often somebody will graduate from library school and believe it or not, have never worked in a library. They just simply went from undergrad to graduate. They went through the program. And even if they get a job, perhaps as a clerk or a page, they don't really have the opportunity to explore what adult services does or what young readers does. So this program uh, gives them an opportunity here at PVLD to sort of mentor in all the different departments. So we announced this very, very recently, and we've actually already had one employee apply for it. So we're very excited about that. And all of these above, um, we're just in December. So there's a lot that we're doing that support our values, our priorities, and all the strategic um, priorities that we've listed. This year's summer reading theme is find your voice. And the Young Readers Department is actively reviewing their programming uh, lineup to ensure that it aligns with our values of community and connection, of learning, inspiration and imagination, and of course, of equity, inclusion and diversity. And it's the same for the adult services programs, including the incredibly popular, or we hope to be very popular, Doors Open Peninsula program that we've spoken so much of. Uh, a community-wide program with now pushing 40 partners perfectly encapsulates encapul what PVLD has talked about in taking on a leadership role in the community and creating opportunities for patrons to connect and learn and share. And these are, again, some of the priorities that the district has listed. You know, Daniel shares all the time how the facilities department um, has uh, really taken on as much as they possibly can do in-house and saving the district hundreds, you know, perhaps thousands of dollars because there are action plan goals of maintaining a solid financial future and promoting sustainability that his team absolutely embrace. <clears throat> and library management, we meet um, every Tuesday morning, all the department managers, including facilities, including finance, including um, all of the adult services and children's. And we review everything that's going on in the library. And um, at least once a month, if not more, we look at our action plan. So always intended to be that fluid and very changeable document. We review it to update our achievements, to list where we are and how we're doing, to adjust time frames maybe add a new action item. We added the ad hoc um, fourth branch location. We've added other things that have come up or maybe remove ones that it turns out it's something that doesn't really fit us. So it helps us to determine our overall district capacity and really focus where we spend our time, our energy and our resources. It's been very helpful in setting those specific tangible goals for the district, for individual library departments, and even individual staff members, because they can look at that and see, oh, this is something that I have on my plate 
for whether it's 2022 or 2023 or 2024. So each of these established goals directly supports what we have said uh, in our strategic principles. In many of the things that we do in the library, many of our tasks are ongoing. They're just simply part of what we do in providing what I think are exceptional library services in a very successful public library. And the action plan allows us to list some of those tasks, but it also gives us the opportunity to list more specific ones with you know, specifically achievable outcomes. It kind of creates a bit of a task list that we all together go back and go through. And it helps us to kind of um, uh, assist that collaborative cross-department work when we can see that three different departments are working on one particular task. So the board was given access to a Google spreadsheet that shows, uh, and I apologize, Jonathan, you might not have yet, so I will absolutely send that to you. you. But honestly, if any of the trustees would like me to resend that, I'd be happy to do it. Um, so what you'll see is um, it's fairly lengthy. It's about six, seven pages of um, a Google spreadsheet that lists out the goals that we have established for this particular three-year term. And if there's anything in particular that you want to know about on that, just let me know. But I will say that overall, the strategic principles that we have, our new mission, our vision, the values that we go back to time and time again, the priorities that we've established as a district and that every department is looking at, they've really, really helped us. And they've been something that's helped guide us and helped us to determine where we want to go and how we want to get there and how as a team we're kind of getting there together. And I certainly don't want to put Ryan on the spot, um, but I know that Ryan works, you know, intimately uh, almost daily with the managers of the bigger departments, adult services and young readers, circulation. So Ryan, if there's anything also that you would want to chime in on how we utilize these documents, I'd be welcome to. I'll say that it, it definitely is a big advantage to have this because we have lots of conversations between myself and the different department managers where we're thinking through which directions we want to go or do we want to do this kind of program or this kind of program? Do we want to provide this service or that? And we always go back to our strategic principles. You know, where are we coming from? What's our foundation? What's our base? So we, we go back to that a lot. It's a great thing to stand on. It's a great thing to point to when we get questions from patrons. Like, I'm curious, what is, well, why did, where did you get the idea from this? Well, we can always point back to our strategic principles and say, this is the foundation. Here's our values. Here's our priorities. And this is why we do the things we do. So it comes up a lot in our planning conversations and it's it's been a very useful tool for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be happy to answer any specific questions about it, but I will say one year in, I mean, we're, we've are we still got till 2025, um, but one year in it's working really well. And we're, we're, you know, we're able to always go back to it and it's helped us to be more collaborative, I think as a district. So that's kind of where we are right now. And again, happy to answer any questions. Well, that's a great report. I know that when we started this process, one of the things that we said was really necessary was that the strategic plan actually be an integral part of the way the library was managed because mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the old strategic plan probably wasn't. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's one of the, yeah, I was talking to actually a library director friend from New Jersey just yesterday who um, is looking to do a new strategic plan. And they actually are looking at constructive disruption, which is an agency that we use to do ours, Stephanie Chase, who came and worked with us. Um, and one of the things that I that I said to them was, you know, as a team, we really enjoyed working with constructive disruption because they also believed that the document needed to be something that you would go back to and it resonated with you at all times. And it was something that could move you into the future. And as Ryan said, literally everything we do, we think about, you know, does this meet our values? Is this something that we believe in? Um, and, and in that regard, it's really helped us because there have been times where maybe we'll get a program suggestion 
And on the surface, it may sound good, but then you kind of dig into it a little bit more and you're like, you know, I don't think this really meshes with what we want to do as a library district. And we might encourage that person to rent the community room and have their event, but we're not going to partner with you. You know, we encourage you to do it, but we need to be mindful that our capacity is being put towards those programs that support what mm -hmm. we believe in. So yeah, it's been really successful. Well, it is nice mm -hmm. to hear that it's a live document. Um, so, and yeah. I one question I had was, it's, it sounds like your library management is referring to it regularly at your meetings. Um, and it's a Google Doc. Is it accessible to everyone, to all staff? And are they familiar with it? Are they um, just? Uh, I mean, it is it is accessible to all staff, yeah. but I do think it's the managers that really come together and look at those plans and, and decide sure. how they're going to assign duties and whatnot. Yeah, and, and also uh, almost all of the managers in their individual department manager meeting, so they get together with their own and they review the document. They'll and review they, look, it. they all have their own kind of separate spreadsheets that just identify their documents, their their department's goals and, and what they're trying to do, the action items for their specific department. So they get together and discuss these, which ones are we focusing on? Which ones do we need to edit, move back? You know, it's a it's a continual discussion. And it, not only does it happen between the individual departments, but then all the managers come together and we have a weekly all department managers meeting where we discuss it there every few weeks as well. So it, it really kind of all the pieces come together and we find that it works well that way. Um, how often is it updated? Um, it almost continuously because the individual departments will go in and do their own updating mm -hmm. all the time. So that's the that's the action plan side of it. We have the strategic principles, which are the static document for the three right. years that have our priorities. They have our, you know, our values, our mission statement, our vision, none of that changes. And then we have the action plan side mm -hmm. of it, which is the one that we revisit, right. you know, weekly. The priorities themselves, um, you know, we've clearly said that these were our priorities to 2025. So in 2025, we should, we will be having sort of an, uh, another broader conversation with the board mm -hmm. that says, okay, our strategic principles are looking to come to an end. Let's come together again and let's look at these. Let's look at the mission. Let's look at the vision. Let's look at our values and our priorities. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not some change in that. As a district with the board, what do we want that to look like for the three years after that? Um, you know, that's something that we'll come together and talk about because we don't want our strategic principles to stagnate. We want them to be constantly, um, you know, current and, and meeting the needs of the community. Mm -hmm. And it could be that something we've listed now doesn't really resonate in 2025, you know, let's hope we don't go through some, you know, major financial or pandemic issue. And, you know, maybe everything will change, you know, who knows? I don't know but, if um, Trustee Butler has had his uh, orientation or uh, meeting with you yet, but it certainly would be a good item to make sure you yeah, sure. Um, you get and, and look yeah. at, because it really does yeah. seem like a guidepost for, for the entire library district. So, yeah. well, and the strategic principles are online. I mean, all of the principles, the values, the mission, it's all online. Um, the sort of internal action plan document, you all have access to it and I'll make sure to send it out again, but, and staff have action uh, access to it, but that's not a public document for the general public. To I see, yes. If you wouldn't mind sending it to, uh, as a reminder, that yeah. would be- We'll resend it. Great. You know, when you're when you're working with it on an ongoing basis, like you and the staff do, do mm -hmm. um, it's probably easy to keep up with what's what's currently changing or what's what's new and what's already been done. If you're not, I know from my own standpoint, it's a little harder because <laughs> you know we don't we're not. It's not redlined. <laughs> no, we don't redline it, but we do try and put like. We color code and we put things in red and we, I mean, we do try to acknowledge like where we are and what we're doing. 
Okay. Well, when you send it out again, maybe we can take a look at it. And see if yeah, I mean, take a look at it and see what you think. And I mean, if you have any specific questions about any specific item, just let me know. and We'll talk about it. And just for the record, it was sent to us on November 7th. So I'm actually looking at it right now. Okay, okay so yeah. yeah, you've got it. And uh, Jennifer and, yeah, included Jonathan, a detailed you're... note with it, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great report, thank you. Thank you. And then we're up to another report, <laughs> <laughs> the district director's monthly yeah. report. And to be honest, um, I know we still have a few things more um, you have my written report. Um, a lot of the big highlights I actually highlighted in my last report. Um, so I'm happy to let the written report stand for tonight. I know we're already um, a few hours in. So um, if you have any questions or, or concerns about my written report, please reach out, please let me know. But for this evening, I'll let it stand. I just want to make one comment about that. I hadn't seen a photo of the happy noon year. Oh, mm -hmm. And I I couldn't believe how many people were in this room. That's wonderful. A yeah. yeah, yeah. I have one question. Do you have any idea how many languages are represented in that new, the button initiative? I love that program. You know, I'm not sure at the moment. I want to say maybe five, five or six. six. Yeah, maybe that. five or six. I know we've got um, Spanish and Hindi. And German, but Japanese, Japanese. Oh, we have Korean. What well, we have the button for that? One. I don't think we've gotten her a button yet, yeah. but we do have an employee who speaks Korean. Me too. Um, and yeah. of course, she <laughs> I'd like a button. <laughs> yes, I'd like a button. <laughs> um, five or six, five or six. Yeah. Just really quickly, because it is January, is a new year, and don't get me wrong, the world is different. But in just in terms of like operating hours, door count, and circulation materials, are we basically returned to a somewhat steady state versus pre-pandemic? We are. And I'm actually, um, Ryan and, and um, uh, digital services manager, uh, David Campbell, and I have been working on a year end. So I should have something for you guys that gives all those details. But yeah, we're actually doing very, very comparable to pre-pandemic numbers. Yeah, um, I mean, it's... It's yeah, especially in circulation. Yeah. We're we're right up there. Well, I, I definitely think that we got a goosing up of circulation when people were stuck in their house and had nothing to do but read. Yeah. Uh, so maybe some of that says in terms of passport activity, are we kind of like we're actually making the same, if not a little higher in passports than activity. we did. In fact, I think I noted it in here that um our our 2022 year end total was yeah. uh, 6,000 passports for a total of 24,000, which is an increase over 2021 yeah. in passports. What we're doing now is working to bring um, passport photos back. Yeah, I know that we're not in, doing that right a, now. Well, I think it'll go to the branches first and then we'll start here. There, We, we do in all things still want to manage the safety issues mm -hmm. and putting too many people in in one place at any given time yeah so it's something that we're looking at but i think even that um well i certainly think the passport is things. an indication of people wanting to get out yeah there's <laughs> you know, a lot of travel being done yeah but you know it's nice to know that using certain very very rudimentary uh you know basics door count circulation yeah. hours definitely it seems like we're almost back to normal if there ever was a normal. Yeah. Thank you, Director Addington. So next we have update from additional library location ad hoc committee trustees Park and Wong. Do you have an update? Um, yes, we, um, we met with the uh, owner and broker for the uh, Lenana Bay property. Uh, turns out that it's a family owned building. Uh, they've owned it for a long, long time. They've had a financial institution of one type or another in that space for the last 40 years. Um, the current space um, is one of the larger spaces or I guess he said the largest space to go on the market 
uh, in Lanata Bay um, in 40 years, <laughs> something like that. So it's uh, kind of a unique situation. Um, we looked at uh, the uh, possibility of taking half the space and he said he would uh, accommodate that. Um, he said that his family was uh, uh, very favorably disposed to the library as a tenant. Uh, they want to give back to the community. They see this as a way of doing it, and they'd be willing to work with us on price uh, to make it uh, possible. Things like uh, paying for um, the uh, property tax, for instance, and things like that. So there wasn't any specifics talked about, um, but um, in terms of um, landlords, he came across as a very credible and very uh, friendly landlord, at least to a, an organization like ours. He said they've turned down space requests from hot yoga people and things like that. Uh, they're looking for a, a more substantial partner. Mm -hmm. So that was all positive. Um, and so the staff right now is looking at cost. In other words, uh, what would be the uh, staffing costs? What would be the potential uh, facilities costs? Uh, because that's gonna be important in terms of looking at uh, how much community support we're gonna to need to make that uh, possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, once we have that, and if it seems at all within the realm of possibility, then we need, need to do more community outreach. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Rhonda Freeze has done a good deal of community outreach <laughs> uh, and has gotten positive from the locals, okay? Mm -hmm. But we probably wanna do more before we go forward. But getting the cost nails down is the next important ask, uh, thing that we want to do. Has there been any these uh, any studies uh, done about actual um, demand in the area? Is that a quantifiable? It's all anecdotal. Anecdotal. Yeah, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say I'm not going to disagree with anything that Trustee Park has said. Um, I think that uh, staff is generating some numbers. And so therefore, maybe in February or even maybe during the budget workshop, I don't know when the numbers will be ready, but I'll just simply say, cause um, I don't wanna you know, have a discussion on something that's not agendized. I I'm very, very um, pessimistic about the prospect, to be honest. Well, uh, <laughs> to, uh... Trustee uh, Easton's comments about feasibility. That was going to be my question. Mm. Um, and as someone who lives in Lunata Bay, not far from that location, you know, I, I personally question the need for it, given that we already have a branch in Palos Verdes Estates. And, you know, I'm not sure that our desire to open additional branch should be based on the because a facility became available, but on where the need actually exists within the entire district. Mm -hmm. And so that's where a feasibility study comes in. Um, you know, rather than it being anecdotal, but us doing a, a, an actual environmental scan mm -hmm. on, on what the, the overall community needs are and, you know, making that, that decision based on an actual need. Yeah, I think that's 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 right. And that's what we'll that's what we're going to do. Um, so next steps would you know. be. I sort of feel like we did the reverse, though. You know, starting with the location and cost, rather well, than starting well, available. I, 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 so things we need to understand is that you know I was on a friend's board uh, for several years before I became a trustee, and for several years the friends have talked about. Um, uh, the fact that we have an annex that services this side of the hill, but not the other side of the hill. And uh, so they thought of it, the, the friends who are thinking about this, think about more in terms of servicing the middle school and the high school that are uh, within walking distance of this location. 
and um, then also whether or not it would make a good community gathering point uh, to help uh, expand our community reach on that side of the hill. So that's where I'm just pointing to Malibu. Yeah, there's, it's there's, just there's, several miles away. Yeah, but <laughs> right too. The uh, I think in turn, I, I think if you think about the the school kids, they're not going to the Malaga Cove place. I don't think very much. So, um, do you need any input from the board about next steps or your committee? No, I think that uh, I have, like I said before, I don't want to go ahead and discuss something that's not on the agenda. I think that when staff comes up with some uh, preliminary numbers, I think that I can express my reasons for pessimism better. Mm -hmm. it, so when we get to future agenda items, is this something that you might want to discuss there? Well, um, as a... a point of order, an ad hoc committee, I think, has to report at every meeting, even if they say we have no report. So the ad hoc committee will be will on be the February agenda. And um, to Trustee Wong's point, we will probably, we have some final kind of numbers to look at, but it could be that we'd be able to share some numbers with the ad hoc committee, um, maybe even tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, we're very close. I think we're very close. So I think by tomorrow afternoon, we might be able to share with you with the ad hoc committee. And, it, and to Trustee Wong's point, it may be something that at least uh, there's a cursory conversation about in the budget workshop mm -hmm. only because it it would be somewhat, it, it, you know, there's a major budgetary uh, component here. Um, not to get into the weeds at the budget workshop, we don't want to do that, yeah. but at least it, kind of a, a high level, you know, potential future costs for the district, mm -hmm. as we look at those, it, it may come up there, and sure. then it will be on the February agenda. Okay, great. Anything else from the ad hoc committee? No. Okay, thank you for, your, for uh, giving us that update. And uh, Community Relations Committee report, Trustee Park, do you have anything um, to communicate? In, in terms of talking about community programs, uh, Sharon and I um, attended the, um, the tea seminar uh, at the library um, a few days ago. And uh, I think that there's about 40 people there and it was maxed out. Uh, there was a waiting list to get in and it was extremely well done. Everybody, I think, learned quite a bit. Uh, um, we got a chance to taste what tea is really supposed to taste like <laughs> from people, right, from people who have, uh, have uh, studied it for a long, long time. And uh, one of whom grew up in, or is Chinese and, I moved over here. And so I think it was a um, uh, a good example of the kind of uh, programs that the library uh, has been putting on and should continue to put on. So that's good. good to hear. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Peninsula Friends of the Library Liaison Report. Um, uh, we had a comprehensive report earlier, so I'm going to move on to the next item, which is government relations liaison report. Trustee Uno, do you have anything to share? I do not. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, appointment of board committees for 2023. So um, thank you for the trustees uh, for responding um, with your interest. And I do have um, the assignments uh, here and I'd like to announce them. The community relations committee uh, head will be uh, Trustee Butler. Uh, thank you for um, your interest in that. Uh, and the Peninsula Friends of the Library uh, Liaison, um, I'm going to add an S to that, liaisons, because our policy provides for up to two and we have two trustees interested. Um, so we have Trustee Uno and Trustee Park. And I think if you two could get together and discuss um, uh, your uh, partnership in that um, 
uh, liaison position, uh, that would be uh, wonderful. And, and, and I do believe you got a um, copy of the policy uh, pertaining to that position. So take a look at that and um, see if you could decide between yourselves how best to uh, coordinate efforts. Thank you. And um, government relations liaison, we have uh, Trustee Wong in that position. And I know he enjoys going to the, uh, um, uh, what is that event? The legislative days. So um, uh, I think he, he would be a perfect fit for this uh, committee uh, leadership. Um, so thank you, trustees, for um, volunteering your services to these committees and liaison positions. So now we have items for future agendas. Trustee, um, I'm sorry, uh, Director Addington, do you have a start for us? Yeah. So. Um... In February, we always review our mid-year budget. So February is a big financial month. The packet will probably have a lot of financial information in there. Um, as we've just said, we will have a budget meeting in between now and then. So next week is our budget. Um, we also, uh, facilities manager Gutierrez and I would like to bring forward another discussion about safety upgrades because we did get some numbers on a camera system and we'd like to share that with you. And and talk about that. We will of course have the um, ad hoc update. And although I haven't written it down, I'm sure there will also be a facilities update mm -hmm. because we'll see where we are with the annex and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then um, everything else is pending at the moment. Kind of I, I know that, um, you know, you can't put the cart before the horse, uh, but do we have any future plans for any kind of opening ceremony for when the glorious day arrives and the sure. annex is open? Cross our fingers for a February, early February completion, which ideally means maybe we'll do like an early March opening. Mm -hmm. Ribbon cutting, cake. All of the above. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fanfare, parade. <laughs> yes. um, all of that all of that any other um recommendations for future agenda items we will have an update on the contracts as well oh absolutely of course mm -hmm. yes the cozen contracts yeah okay and just as a note i am also following up on um trustee uno's uh, request for the uh, board training, um, looking at trying to be a little more financially savvy with it. So, so I'll have some more information for you. So, so the board training um, is in addition to, because uh, I, 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 I kind of consider the our meeting with the with legal counsel as well as part of our training of sorts. Um, but you're talking about something different, but I did. The potential of being the same thing. Has the potential of being the same thing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, ultimately, we were looking to legal to do that training. Mm -hmm. I'm also mindful of our training budget and what that's looking like. So it may be that we don't get that training from legal, mm -hmm. but I've um, been in conversation with somebody from the California Special Districts Association mm -hmm. who's a certified governance person mm -hmm. who could also do it and so, they will focus on the fact that you know that we are a we library. are a special district yeah. yes and and, that's, and a library which is you know which you'll find when you go to the training yeah, um, a lot of a it is district. very right. high level yeah the covering things that we don't Mm -hmm. The individual that I'm speaking to has has done this for special district libraries. Okay, perfect. So, and um, there would be a definite. And cost. in California, there's four. Yeah, there's something. not very many. Yeah. <laughs> so. So yes, I'm investigating that now because okay. I, I just think financially we may get more for our um, investment mm -hmm. by not using legal. Right. Okay. Okay, I think. Um, only one item left. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. I get to use this gavel. <laughs>